In the first part of this series we looked at some of the unexplained problems of the sum. The basic premise of Robitaille's model is that most of these problems will be eliminated if we consider the sun to have a liquid surface. Now this is no ordinary liquid, there are a number of aspects to the model which are important, but also some pretty major caveats, so let's dive in and find out more. What on earth could this liquid be made of? Well, the sun is obviously largely hydrogen, so a special kind of liquid hydrogen called liquid metallic hydrogen. The concept is that the entire sun is made of liquid metallic hydrogen. This liquid hydrogen forms a lattice structure very similar to graphite. He views that the liquid sun would be virtually incompressible, so the density would remain fairly constant throughout. This means that there is no massive compression point at the centre, which is required to generate fusion in the current model. There is no gravitational collapse which would have been halted by the outward radiative pressure or electron pressure. Instead he views that nuclear reactions occur throughout the entire volume of the Sun. The important point to realise is that in this model the Sun is still a simple thermonuclear reactor, but it just occurs everywhere rather than only at the centre. The concept relies on the fact that liquid metallic hydrogen is created at a certain pressure and then remains in this state even when the pressure and temperature changes. This is what they refer to as metastable. As we saw in the last episode, theoretical predictions indicate that solid metallic hydrogen is only metastable in a very narrow pressure region and quickly results back to its molecular form as pressure is removed. The ranges of pressure quoted would not be sufficient to maintain its metallic state anywhere near the surface of the Sun. But it must be noted that this is only based on theoretical calculations and it is highly questionable whether we have even got close to achieving the solid metallic hydrogen state. In all the experiments so far, as soon as the pressure was removed, their sample resorted back through the phases. Here you could argue that this may also be another indication that we have not reached the metallic state, but only further experiments will either prove or disprove it. So far both experiments and the model seem to indicate that it will not be stable at the pressure required to remain a metallic state at the surface. In Robitaille's model the liquid metallic hydrogen is not like any normal liquid, but instead forms a hexagonal lattice structure. As we saw in the previous episode, so little is known about the structure of hydrogen, even in its solid molecular state, that making assumptions on a lattice structure for a liquid state is a very big assumption which itself is built on top of the assumption of it being metastable, which is then built on top of the assumption that metallic hydrogen is an achievable state. The only modelling I could find on liquid metallic hydrogen would suggest a much more random movement rather than a hexagonal lattice, which is what you would expect to form from a liquid compared to a solid. It may be possible that due to closer spacing temporary lattices do form which may then be more hexagonal in shape. The concept of this lattice structure is important to understanding how this model functions. The idea is that this lattice forms into sheets and that material can get trapped in between these layers. The space between the layers is referred to as the intercalate regions. This is where most of the elements will end up being produced. Fusion takes place here. The method of how fusion occurs is not really explained in any detail. In his paper he discusses that helium would be synthesized due to the need to relieve underlying strain of the stellar pressure on the underlying lattice. Two protons combine to form a deuteron. This would then immediately combine with another proton in the same plane resulting in the formation of helium, which would then be ejected from the lattice and forced into the intercalate region. Over time these intercalate regions are the birthplace of all the elements but this doesn't really explain how these protons are forced into the initial fusion, what strain is being relieved and why would a strain energy cause a fusion reaction. This comes back to the question of the structure of the liquid metallic hydrogen and if it has any capability of supporting strain in this way, let alone causing a fusion reaction. The problem is that in his model he assumes that the density of this material remains fairly constant so it is unclear how fusion could be initiated. In some of his more recent videos he refers to lattice fusion experiments conducted by NASA. <laughs> 
Here deuterium atoms are injected into a metal lattice and a neutron can then trigger a fusion reaction within the lattice. The metal is many times greater than the deuterium that is injected into the lattice and in fact the elements produced would end up being much larger and it is not clear what effect this would have on the integrity of the lattice. It would require the initial production of deuterium into the space between the lattice before this process could start. The difference here is that the only place that this can come from is the lattice itself. So the process would end up causing the removal and the conversion of this, thereby destroying the lattice and halting the process. There are aspects of this liquid lattice structure that are unclear to me. If we do assume that the liquid can take on this structure, then it must be a fleeting and temporary structure. In his examples, he often likens it to graphite, which is a solid, where material can form in between layers of graphite and become trapped. How could this material be trapped if the lattice is fleeting? Surely this material would simply move through it and would not be held in there. The idea that rows of layers form is also something that I struggle with if we consider that the structure is temporary. What happens to all the energy and the photons that get released? I think the concept is that a lot of the energy is transferred through conduction to the surface rather than convection, as convection would cause the disruption to the lattice. Gamma rays should be produced by the fusion reaction. How and where these get converted to lower energy photons is not at all clear. This is especially important as the assumption is that these reactions occur throughout the solar interior, which means that many will occur at or near the surface. Yet we know that the majority of the light emitted by the sun falls into the visible spectrum. One piece of evidence he gives for the surface being liquid relates to the temperature of the photosphere which appears to be cool compared to the interior. In a black body radiator, the temperature we detect from the emissions given off directly relate to the surface temperature. The hotter an object is, the higher energy photons it will emit. And the argument goes something like this. All normal matter at temperatures above absolute zero emits electromagnetic radiation, which represents a conversion of a body's internal thermal energy into electromagnetic energy and it is therefore called thermal radiation. Equally, all matter absorbs electromagnetic energy to some degree. An object that absorbs all radiation falling on it at all wavelengths is called a black body. When a black body is at a uniform temperature, its emissions have a characteristic frequency distribution that depends on the temperature. This is what is referred to as black body radiation. So the temperature of the photosphere was essentially determined based on the profile of the curve we observe. Now, there are obviously objects that are not true body radiators that have a very different shape compared to a true black body. Robitaille argues that the sun is not a black body and is not in equilibrium, so we cannot determine the temperature from the curve and assume it is a black body. So what is the temperature then? And why would it be different from the quoted 6,000 Kelvin? It is important to understand that we don't really understand how this thermal radiation is produced, but an example of the description is as follows. Thermal radiation is generated when heat from the movement of charges in the material is converted to electromagnetic radiation. An alternative explanation is the mechanism of radiation emissions is related to energy released as a result of oscillations or transitions of electrons that constitute matter. So Robitaille's argument is based on the idea that we often refer to this being caused by vibrations in the lattice causing the emissions and that in a liquid we could also be dealing with a motion of the entire fluid in a common direction rather than chaotic. Now an important point to realise is that this may mean that the liquid metallic hydrogen is moving. He argues that this could mean that although we only register a temperature of 6000 Kelvin, the actual energy of these particles could equate to millions of degrees, meaning a lot of the energy is hidden in the motion of the particles. This would also mean that these lattice structures would be even more fleeting, and I find it hard to understand how strain energy could be applied to a moving fluid and that this then causes a fusion reaction. The concept of energy being stored in the movement of a fluid must also apply to a gas or plasma, especially if we consider a plasma that is exposed to an electric field causing it to start to flow just like a liquid. 
His idea for why solar flares are much hotter and emit X-rays is therefore explained in this model due to the fact that this energy is suddenly liberated from the surface. I'm presuming here that this induces more random collisions causing the observed temperatures to appear higher, but why this suddenly produces X-rays is not clear as the whole surface should be producing them if fusion reactions are occurring there. Sunspots can be thought of as areas where the surface has been lifted up forming two sunspots. He then explains that these areas would have a different lattice structure which would be more metallic. What is not explained is what happens to the material that is uplifted, and why do the layers not reconnect to other closer layers? If the liquid metallic hydrogen is confined to these layers and still flows, wouldn't it continue to pour out? The idea is also that the magnetic fields of the two sunspots are connected, but it's unclear how this would work. A magnetic field requires the movement of charge, but if the two ends are severed, how can there be flowing charge to create the magnetic field? It may be possible that this different lattice structure is somehow able to sustain a magnetic field, but it is not clear why the two ends would remain linked, i.e. creating two opposite fields that connect. And this also adds yet another liquid phase lattice structure for which I can find no evidence. So what are the granulations in this model then? They are not the tops of convection columns, but instead physical undulations on the surface. The darker regions represent areas where the photons are not directly emitted towards the observer, making them appear darker. What is not clear is what causes these undulations in the model, and why do they change so rapidly? So what about the changes in solar activity? How is this accounted for? When the sun is quiet, the solar wind acts to remove intercalate atoms that exist between the planes by ejecting them from the poles or coronal holes. With solar activity, these are expelled from the equatorial regions of the interior into the corona and beyond. He views that the changes in solar activity are because of the requirement to degas the intercalate regions of the sun. Again here, I struggle to see how, if the lattice is able to confine elements deep within the star to cause fusion reactions, how could they then suddenly bubble up towards the surface? How exactly the solar wind works in this model is very unclear. Each hydrogen layer forms a barrier preventing the diffusion of other elements. How do the protons then get ejected forming the solar wind? Why is there a fast and a slow solar wind? And why are the speeds so different? Maybe I'm missing something here, but I see no mechanism to simply eject protons into the solar wind, and secondly, by what mechanism the solar wind is then accelerated away. Here, it is important to understand that the solar wind undergoes a continued acceleration long after leaving the surface. What about those surface waves we discussed in the first part of the series? The mainstream explanation is rather strange, requiring acoustic waves that travel downwards, but due to temperature changes are bent and refracted back to the surface. Even with the concept of a liquid surface, this does not fully explain how the waves could accelerate as they did. Now one point he raises about the physical structure of the sun states that a gas cannot form a visible surface with what appears as structures like granulations on the surface. This is partly true for a gas, but not true if we consider plasma. Plasma can form distinct surfaces that can have an equivalence to surface tension. A while ago I covered an experiment and paper published by Popescu which showed the self-organized charge configuration bordered by electric double layers and showed the surface tension in plasma related to these double layer formations. We have previously also looked at the simple concept that charge segregation due to gravity, which on an object as large as a star would cause it to become a net positive object. This would already mean that there would likely be a double layer at the surface because of this. Structures like granulations could be explained as anode tufts in the electric sun model. Robitaille raises an interesting point about the maximum compressibility of the sun. In the standard model, the core area is thought to get up to the density of over 150 grams per centimeter cubed. They need this in order to gain the incredible pressures required to initiate a fusion reaction. The experiments aimed at producing solid metallic hydrogen 
only go to show how hydrogen is capable of resisting this pressure. In simple terms, this may come back to the concept outlined as part of the structured atomic model, and the idea that there is a densest packing. This would imply that something else is responsible for causing the fusion, or in some terms, the rearrangement of the nucleus, but this is a topic that is worth exploring in more detail separately. The point to consider is that there may be a point beyond which additional pressure will not yield any more compression of the structure, meaning there may well be a maximum density that is possible which may be much lower than the theoretical 150 grams per centimetre cubed assumed for the centre of the Sun. Now Robitaille assumes that the entire Sun would be composed of liquid metallic hydrogen, and that the density is essentially the same across the entire volume. He often states that liquids are not compressible, but that's not entirely true. When we looked at superionic ice, we saw a highly unusual state of water was achieved by compressing a drop of water. Most liquids are in a compact state, but apply enough pressure and you can squeeze out those last small spaces, and even bring the entire structure into a new phase as we saw with water. Now, when we consider liquid metallic hydrogen, it is fair to assume that those particles are going to be much closer together, but when you examine the graph showing the states, you can clearly see there is an upward curve on the solid line. As I pointed out earlier, not much is known about the theoretical states, and hence density values equally vary. Some state a predicted value for liquid metallic hydrogen as 0.7 grams per centimetre cubed, and for solid metallic hydrogen, some go up as high as 2 grams per centimetre cubed. If we consider this and look at the estimated density of the Sun, we can see this comes in at about 1.41 grams per centimetre cubed, more than double that of liquid metallic hydrogen. Now, I see there are two different ways of explaining why the density is almost double that of liquid metallic hydrogen. First, that this additional density comes from the heavier elements being created in the intercalate regions. Alternatively, it could be due to the fact that we find solid metallic hydrogen towards the centre, or it could be a combination of both of these. So how does this process of star formation start? His concept is that stars are formed when hydrogen clusters start to form condensed matter, a little bit like the way a crystal might form and grow from a nucleation point. So this is a slow building process, not a gravitational collapse one, and this also requires that the heat must be dissipated to stop the temperature from rising. So stars are built from condensed matter and remain as condensed matter. What is not clear is how or why the hydrogen would condensate without high pressure. So what about the different types of stars? How would they be explained in this model? Stellar luminosity depends on the lattice structure. Main sequence stars share the same hexagonal structural lattice. The luminosity can then vary based on the mass and the radius. He suggests that stars that exist off the main sequence would have a different structural lattice. Stars would enter the main sequence as massive O-class objects, then slowly cool and move down the sequence as they age. Once on the main sequence, stars only move off this through lattice changes or exfoliative processes like a supernova or the formation of a red giant star. The starting point could be something like a Wolf-Riot star, which in the conventional Hertzsprung diagram does not appear, as they claim that they cannot see the photosphere. In Robitaille's model, the reason for this is that the liquid surface does not have a well-formed lattice structure. The strong and broad emission lines from these types of stars might be due to the condensation process, which are exothermic reactions resulting in radiative emissions. As stars cool, they would then progress to luminous blue variables and so on. The variability in these stars is then explained by invoking the idea that the liquid metallic hydrogen undergoes lattice changes and that this in turn alters its emissions. The concept is that if the pressure lies just on a boundary of a phase change, small changes could cause a sudden change to the entire star. What is a little odd about this is that he previously stated that main sequence stars all share the same hexagonal lattice, and yet here uses the difference in a lattice structure to explain the variability. What about supergiant stars? 
Here the concept is that in these stars the lattice structure is strong enough to prevent the material which builds up in the intercollect regions from escaping. This material slowly expands and this in turn causes the star to expand as well. Here we are back to the question as to why the lattice does not break, as the fusion reactions produce the material in the intercollect regions, and also why sometimes it seems to stop the material from escaping and yet, in other scenarios, the assumption is that the material slowly makes its way to the surface. A supernova would be a violent expansion of the material in an intercalate region. In both the previous cases, there is little information available explaining it in any depth. The problem I have with the supernova explanation is how could the outer layer survive such an expansion? If we assume that it is a rigid lattice, then even a small change in the radius causes a massive change to the surface area, meaning at some point the structure has to rupture. Given hydrogen's incredible ability to compress, and the assumption that liquid metallic hydrogen is metastable, I don't really understand how it would remain in this state, and survive the strain it is placed under. And could this really produce the energy we see from supernova explosions? What about white dwarfs? Again here he invokes a change of lattice structure, away from a hexagonal planar one he expects for main sequence stars. In this model, stars are not small, highly compact bodies, but simply the change in their lattice causes big changes in their luminosity. Let's just take a moment here, as I really don't see how this could even be possible. The assumption leading up to this point is that liquid metallic hydrogen is metastable. In order to allow liquid metallic hydrogen to exist at the surface rather than only in the interior, we need a material that once compressed will retain its structure. This means that at the surface we are way outside the pressure ranges you would expect to see for any type of transition. So small changes here should really make no impact on this change. This all of course assumes that liquid metallic hydrogen is metastable and has a defined lattice, which I am really not convinced by. What is not clear is how this might change over the lifetime of a star. Assuming fusion reactions take place all across the star, the entire sphere will slowly be turned to helium. How does this affect the lattice structure? There is a possibility that metallic helium exists and this may also form a lattice structure, but not at the same pressures and temperature ranges and again the question of it being metastable and across what range needs to be asked. So what would happen to a star as the liquid metallic hydrogen structure slowly decays? Or is the assumption that all heavier elements are built in the intercalate regions? So at what point does the integrity of the hexagonal structure break down enough to halt the process? What are we left with? What about red dwarf stars? How could their excessive flaring be explained in this model? As there is no gravitational collapse in this model, there can also be no black holes. But this is never specifically mentioned. How are pulsars and neutron stars explained? One important point to realise is that Robitaille views that the photosphere has no net positive charge, due to the existence of hydrides on the disk of the sun and in sunspots, and hence the solar body must be neutral. He views that only the corona could have a net positive charge. Robitaille clearly demonstrates the many problems with our current model of not only the sun but also stars in general, and how simple assumptions have led us to make wild assumptions about what happens to stars. His model of a liquid metallic hydrogen star at first glance would appear to be an alternative way of explaining many of these in a different way. The fundamental assumption of this model is that liquid metallic hydrogen is metastable, that it can support a variety of lattice structures that these layers can expel other atoms from the lattice, thereby restricting them to the intercalate regions, and finally that fusion reactions can take place here and do not affect the integrity of the lattice structure. And this is where I have a problem with the model. It is built on top of one assumption after another. The concept of lattice structure is interesting, even if it is not metastable and therefore only exists in the interior. The potential electrical behaviour of this material and the idea of lattice confined fusion reactions is worth exploring in more detail. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time. <laughs>